Hello, this is Larry Hedrick with Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains, where we bring the past into the present for you and our future viewers. Today we have an incredible story by Mr. Clay Wurst. Well, the Dutchman ended up filing a homestead near what is now the, the present site of Phoenix. It was along what was called Henshaw Road, at that time nothing but a dirt track. But he filed on a quarter section of land, built a pretty decent adobe home, planted a big garden, got himself up a bunch of chickens, even planted a, a small field of barley. And when the census taker came by, he gave himself in as a farmer. Well, in the ensuing years, he discovered the Lost Dutchman Mine, apparently while he was searching for the Lost Dock Thorn Mine. But he was living in his adobe in February of 1891 when the Salt River flooded. And even before the waters of the Salt River got to his home, there was a ditch called the Dutch Ditch that crossed his property, a big irrigation ditch from the northeast to the southwest. That ditch overflowed, washed away his adobe. Some claim that he spent two days and two nights up a cottonwood tree before Riney Patrash got the sheriff on a boat, came, rescued the Dutchman, took him to the home of Julia Thomas, a young black woman that she may have only been mulatto, but lived in Phoenix. And it was interesting how she came to know the Dutchman. Because the Dutchman, uh, Julia, Julie had married a man named Emil Thomas up in Denver, had moved down to, to Phoenix, and with them brought this young lad, Reinhardt, they called him Reine Petrash. The Thomas family and the Petrash family had become good friends when they lived in Denver. And Julie and Emil brought Reine with them down to Phoenix, rented a adobe on Jackson Street, and set up a bakery and a confectionery on Washington Street. And Riney, as a young lad, helped there with the bakery. Well, one day the Dutchman walked into Julia's bakery and without thinking, simply addressed her as V. Gates and was astounded when she started a conversation in perfect German. Her father was named Kalm. He was evidently German, but there is also a story that Julia grew up in a family where her parents were domestic servants in a German-speaking household. That at any rate, for whatever reason, Julia spoke fluent German. And Reine, we're not dead sure if he was actually born in Germany, born in transit to the United States, or born in this country. But at any rate, Reine grew up in a learned to talk in a German-speaking household. And Reine was fluent in German. And this was the bond that formed between Julia Thomas, Reine Petrash, and Jacob Waltz the Dutchman. Whenever they were together, they always spoke German. Well, in the months between February of 1891 and October of that year when the Dutchman died, he lived at Julia's, and Julia was his caretaker. And a number of times she asked him, Grandpa, she called him Grandpa, she said, you know, you're not well. He'd contracted pneumonia as a result of his exposure when he was trapped in the flood. He said, you're not 
really well and you're not getting any younger. Don't you think it's time you told Riney and me how to go to the mine? Well, I'm getting ahead of my story. Julia's husband, Emil, abandoned her and left her in Phoenix with this bakery owing about $3,000 worth of unpaid bills, no way whatever of paying for them. And she broke down in front of the Dutchman and was amazed when he told her not to worry that all of this would be taken care of. She was more amazed when he showed up a few days later with about 30 pounds of extremely high-grade gold ore. And all of Julia's bills, all of her debts around Phoenix, were paid with high-grade gold ore. The Dutchman also drew a draft on Wells Fargo for $2,500 to an outfit, I'm not sure it may have been in Chicago, for an ebony and marble soda fountain that Julia had installed in her confectionery and bakery. That's when Julia, finally realizing that the Dutchman had a, a source of gold, asked him, don't you think it's time that you told Riney and me how to go to the mine? because the Dutchman by then was, was quite indisposed. He was not the least bit offended by the question. He thought it was perfectly natural that someone should know where this, where this gold of his was coming from. And he said in the spring when the weather's warm and there's still water in the canyons, He'll get a, we'll get a, a light wagon and a team and a camp outfit and we'll go out to the board house. And he said, we'll have to leave the wagon there. He said, I'll ride one of the horses, we'll pack the other one, and you and Riney wear your old heavy clothing because we've got to pack back into some terribly rough, brushy country. And he said, if I'm not able to travel, I'll have to stay there at the board house with the woman and the three children. And I'll point the way and direct you as best I can. You'll have to go over the ridge north of the board house. Now the board house was the old Cavanus place. Matt Cavanus was the first rancher to actually settle in the Superstition Mountain area. But he was initially a freighter. He had a freight contract run, uh, hauling Silver King ore with a 20 mule ox team overland to Fort Yuma, where it was shipped by sea around the Baja Peninsula to a smelter in San Francisco. This was before the mill was built there at Pinal. And on one of his backhauls, rather than deadheading back empty, he brought back a load of East Coast lumber that had been shipped around Cape Horn and built the first board house in this part of the country. There wasn't a sawmill built in Arizona until one was built up at Flagstaff. It was a few years after that. But at that time, at least, there were no, no mill-sawed lumber here available in the Salt River Valley. And people then built with what they had. It was either stone or adobe. And because the board house was unique, it was usually referred to simply as the board house rather than the cavernous place. Well, Matt and, Avenus, uh, Matt and Alice Cavanus were divorced. And in the divorce settlement, she got the ranch and he got the freighting outfit. And she lived there at the ranch with their three children, Albert, Aaron, and Anson. Albert was the first white child born in Phoenix. 
So when the Dutchman talked about going out to the board house and that if he was not able to travel, he'd have to stay at the board house with the woman and the three children, there's absolutely no question but what the Dutchman's point of departure to take Julian Reine to the mine was the Cavanus Ranch. This is unquestionable. Now, in later years, stories came out that the Dutchman mine was right here at Goldfield, usually by someone that had mining properties for sale at Goldfield, wanting to present them as the Lost Dutchman mine. The Lost Dutchman mine is not here at Goldfield. If it were here at Goldfield, they could have driven right up to it with a buckboard. Why this talk about going 15 miles past Goldfield to the board house and then talk, saying you have to go up over the ridge north of the board house, back into the Superstition Mountains? No, the Lost Dutchman mine is not here at Goldfield. It's back in the Superstitions somewhere somewhere out there. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. 